All right, here we go. Are you recording? I am now recording. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so um, my set of questions was regarding um, reprojection error, photometric error, and it was just a couple of qualitative questions. Um, so what is uh, reprojection error? Um, reprojection error is defined as the summed Euclidean distance between the estimated projection of a 3D point and the measured point in an image. So here is a little illustration of that. Um, as we project our 3D space into 2D space, there's going to obviously be um, errors associated with that measurement. Um, and that Euclidean distance between what we're getting and what our estimation is using our camera models is defined as the reprojection error. Any questions on that? Nope. All right. Um, the next question that I had was what is uh, photometric error? Um, and so photometric error is defined as the intensity difference between pixels observing the same point in two scenes. So this image uh, kind of illustrates that. Um, between two scenes, right, um, the intensity that are being observed uh, can be, <coughs> sorry, uh, in this case, right, you're looking to minimize the actual transformation that minimizes the photometric error. So here from two scenes, as you're observing pixels, various pixels will be seeing the same intensity based on what you're observing. Um, and so that difference itself is the actual photometric error. Um, I don't think you have to be observing the same point in two scenes, right? It's literally well, so, pixel, yeah. pixel error regardless yeah. of what. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Sorry, this was specifically, I guess, for the actual camera pose transformation, um, because that can be optimized to minimize the photometric error. Because if you're observing the same point, technically, the, uh, the photometric error will be, will be minimal, right? If you're seeing the same scene, the same picture. Sorry, good point. My explanation was not up to snuff there. Um, so yeah, so this is, sorry. I was going to say, this is from SVO, right? This is from SVO, yeah. So how do they, uh, I haven't fully read, finished the paper yet, but how do they choose these uh, blue patches? Did, uh, do you remember? Yeah, so they don't, so with photometric error, you can kind of use every pixel technically, yes. um, but in order to do that, they break it up into four by four patches of pixels. Um, and so, well, I'm trying to think because they do some smoothing with uh, with direct with indirect methods too, but I don't think that's actually incorporated here. Um, no. Yeah, I I believe it's just divided up into four by four patches throughout the entire image. Throughout the whole entire image. I believe so. Um, I should double check this. Yeah, because. Uh, I think SVO is kind of uh, particular in that they they say that they're doing uh, semi-direct methods, but at the same time, there's one stage in the pipeline where they do bundle adjustment at the back end. They do, yeah. It, it's interesting because they, they're they doing their direct and their indirect. Uh, they're, they're continuing to refine it based off of a map that they're constantly creating at a slower interval. So they're doing their direct, just photometric error minimization, I believe pretty frequently. Yes. And then they're building up a higher definition map. And then through that, they're further refining their pose estimate through a, a direct method on that and then an indirect method, I believe. That's how I understood it. Um, I need to recheck my notes. It's been a little while. Yes. Um, and so that was the interesting thing. So that they're not relying on real time use of their direct methods uh, or of their indirect stuff, sorry, because they're just doing that an occasion during keyframes um, is when they do that. So yeah, um, I'm wondering, should I look that up right now or should I move on and I can come up with an answer by the end of the lecture? Sure. Okay. Um, so, 
Yeah, because like um, I think I was reading uh, DSO as well. Uh, not DSO, LSD. Yep. Um, I'm not sure how they also uh, get the subset of, um, of pixels. How do they choose those subset of pixels uh, to do direct um, metric mm -hmm. error calculation? So uh, when I looked at uh, when I briefly looked at the two papers, LSD Slam and SVO, they seem to be talking about the same thing. So it'd be nice to be able to clarify. How that? Yeah. No, for sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll dive into that um, once I'm done screen sharing and get a better answer because I, I definitely have taken notes on that and it's just escaping me right now, um, yeah. unfortunately. So, okay. Um, so the next question: um, Which parameters can be optimized to minimize the reprojection error, and how does this differ from the optimization and bundle adjustment? And this was. Uh, a trick question, poorly worded. Um, the optimization in bundle adjustment is done to minimize the reprojection. <laughs> um, the parameters that can be modified here are the camera intrinsic matrix, the camera extrinsic matrix, so the actual pose of the camera, and the location of the 3D point. So trick question, I hope I fooled some of you. Um, but that being said, not all of these three things need to be modified to minimize your uh, bundle adjustment, depending on what you're doing, right? Or sorry, to minimize your reprojection error. Bundle adjustment is the minimization of all of these things, but I mean, you can easily just minimize the camera pose if you're sure of where your 3D points are and where what your camera intrinsic matrix is. Or you can just, you know, there, these are the three things that you can modify to optimize, um, to minimize your reprojection. Um, and then lastly, what are the four coordinate frames associated with calculating the reprojection error? And so this is, uh, this stems from what we're measuring and to what our final measurement actually is. And so uh, the four frames are the world frame, the camera frame, the, pix uh, the film coordinate frame, and the pixel coordinate frame. And so this is illustrated here. Oh, sorry. There you go. This is illustrated here. Um, so the uh, world coordinates are uh, X, Y, Z, just somewhere in the world. And you have your extrinsic matrix, your rotation, and your translation that pull you into the camera coordinate frame located at the optical center. Um, from here, you have the image coordinates themselves. Oh, sorry. I actually had a, uh, I had a coordinate frame in the center there with an X and Y, but it seems to have disappeared. Hmm. Um, but there is, so from the camera coordinate frame, uh, you can project into the film coordinate frame, and that's the translation from 3D to 2D. That's your intrinsic, that's most of your intrinsic matrix. Um, but then in addition to that, your intrinsic matrix also will include the motion, the motion from your film coordinates to your pixel coordinates, which is your standard, um, that's your standard definition of a pixel measurement and where you might find something, an image. Sure. So yeah, any other questions or? I never actually saw these film coordinates before. Yeah. The film yeah. Well, so it's, it's actually defined in your camera intrinsic matrix, um, which I don't, let me see if I can. I've seen like, like idealized coordinates. Yeah, yeah, the word film is kind of a nice one, right? Yeah, it's, uh, I, that's how Jason actually was referring to it in his, um, in his uh, presentations as well, um, but, it's nice. Oh, sorry. I think my screen sharing is paused. Uh, Do I still see it? Yeah, I'm trying to share another. Um, hang on one second. Let me let me share this presentation now. There you go. So here, in, in your camera intrinsic matrix, um, this is incorporated here. And this diagram was actually backwards, but you can see this PX and PY actually will show the mapping from the corner or your uh, pixel coordinates to the film coordinates, which is how your projection would just do it. Are you pointing at some something other than the title screen? Um, is my screen not shared? No, your screen's there. It was just, oh, it just is, wasn't updating. Oh, it's it looked so, like okay. you, were, you were just speculating, but then it was still on the title screen. So oh, no. <laughs> the mouse was moving. We weren't sure what you were pointing at. Or is, is it cameras part one camera yep. matrix? Yep, yeah, exactly. So this is okay. a bit backwards from the other drawing because technically your, uh, your 
pixel coordinates should be the top left corner. I think the standard that we're all pretty used to. Um, but here, so they've got the pixel coordinates at the bottom left and the film coordinates in the center here. Um, and so in your camera intrinsic matrix, this PX and PY kind of incorporate that transformation as well. Um, and so your camera intrinsic matrix includes both the transformation from your camera coordinate frame to the film coordinate frame, and then the film to the pixel. So that um, is how all that information gets encoded. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see what my screen's actually sharing. So sorry about that. No, of course. That's yeah. so, um, funny yeah. that there's that kind of lag. That's all. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Makes sense. Okay. That's all I had. All right. Who's next? Oh, it's not me, is it? I'll check the homework. <laughs> Who's next? Who's the second slide? Yeah, oh, it's, that's, it's that's implemented 2D scan registration. Um, that's Ben's. No. Oh, ben. is Ben out with uh, Arun? In the garage. Yeah, okay. It's designed in terms. So yeah, I have to modify my homework question a little bit because <laughs> there's one term, I mean, there's several terms that I don't actually understand, to be honest, and it's not a trivial thing to, right. to look up. Um, so, do you, so I kind of redefined the question as what do these uh, four sort of noise terms mean. So generally you would find these in the L invariance curve. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, quantization noise, um, is basically when you're reading the IMU, you're converting analog signal to digital signal. So during the conversion, you would have a sort of the least significant bit um, error. So it's like either one or zero at the end of the, the on the least significant bit. Um, the second one, which is, all right, I should have skipped to this bit. So the second uh, kind of noise, the random walk noise, is actually uh, the the same uh, as the rate and acceleration uh, walk noise. Uh, so in terms of angle and velocity, that is sort of like the integration of the gyroscope um, output or the accelerometer uh, random walk noise. And then the rate and acceleration is the, the original uh, gyroscope and uh, gyroscope random walk noise. So when we're sort of using the standard noise model, we're trying to model two things, the white noise and a slowly moving bias, uh, which is denoted as these two equations right here. And so uh, when we want to get the, the variance of noises, <laughs> Well, that's where we use uh, the Allen variance to um, these two kinds of noise. And bias instability noise is basically a fundamental measure of how the goodness of the sensor. And it's basically defined as the, the bottom of the Allen variance curve. So I should really have had a plot to reiterate what I mean. So from previous uh, lecture, when I gave the talk on L invariance, um, you generally want to obtain a alien, alien deviation plot. And so when you plot the deviation, you'd be able to identify different noises on the curve by looking at literally reading off the plots. 
So on the left, you have uh, quantization noise, uh, random walk, angle random walk if you're analyzing a gyroscope. So this would become uh, velocity random walk if you're analyzing an uh, accelerometer. And then the bias instability, the bottom of the curve here with the uh, slope um, of zero, uh, that's the measure of bias instability. So I don't actually know the reason why or how um, these different uh, signals, I mean, these different noises are identified on this curve, but that is the definition. I can't really find out more unless I take a signal processing course on how they derive this. So that's basically the basic definitions of how you read off the, the Allen variance curve. Mm -hmm. Um, the standard noise model, as I said before, it's um, so X is the slowly moving uh, bias that you're trying to model, and this is the sort of like how you update the slowly moving bias uh, and plus V. V is just white noise. So you have in the standard noise model, you have two independent white noise, one towards the whole total uh, noise process that you're trying to model, and one towards the slowly moving uh, bias uh, in the X. Yep. Yep. And so the second question was like, how uh, to simulate an IMU. So there's not much to it. You just have to write the code and then simulate the standard noise model. So on the X axis, I have time. Uh, it's pretty small, but it's basically a DT, uh, a sample rate of a thousand, a uh, hundred hertz at some arbitrary length of time. And Y is the output of the, the noise. So I didn't label the, the noise because it's dependent on whether you apply it to a gyroscope or a uh, accelerometer. Is generally the standard noise model. You can generally put it. You can append it to the uh, gyroscope, the true gyroscope um, measurement, or the true uh, accelerometer measurement. So it depends on how you apply it to what sense. And the first thing when you do uh, noise analysis was that you. Uh, apply it to something called a power spectral density. And as you can see, it's sort of like a flat sort of chart that doesn't really, didn't, like you can't really uh, depict much, you can't get much information from a power density, spectral density plot. So that's why you have something like an Allen variance uh, plot. So I applied the something called the overlapping Allen variance method, which is the, the most popular common method of analyzing noise. And so based on this curve, I could apply the same, uh, I basically read off different uh, characteristics of the noise by just reading the, the chart. And um, by using the by reading off the charts, I was able to uh, obtain the original um, sort of uh, variance that I put into the standard model. So in the standard model noise, I gave it a variance in the bias of 0.1 and in the random walk of 0.05. And then I went through the whole overlapping um, Allen variance method to be able to obtain uh, uh, the, the values close to what I put in, essentially. So it's a sort of a validation of that it got really close to what I put in. So yes, that's pretty much my homework in terms of the topic. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, there's certainly a lot behind it all, right? The Allen variance method, it's still cloudy for me too. I've never really been through the deep 
uh, spectral analysis. And there's a lot to that field. So I think we're fine to remain users, you know. Yes, it's not something that I don't think uh, a two week reading is going to yield much understanding behind the yeah. behind it. Yeah. It's definitely one of the hardest things I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the school that it worked. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, next is my discussion topics from my landmark based visual odometry picture. Okay. So I commented on how algorithm choices uh, in the algorithms I talked about seem kind of empirical and arbitrary. And then I asked if we should value the kitty results and we had some talk about it last week. Um, to recap, one of the things I showed last week was this uh, work that was the, that's the current leader in the kitty stereo odometry leaderboard which is called soft and it's based on libviso2 which i also talked about and which is pretty old and simplistic mm -hmm. and this whole point is to have a really fast runtime so it's kind of surprising that this one was on the top of the leaderboard and uh, it works a lot better than libviso2 because that's the results from that and it actually gives good results um, and an interesting thing was uh, in this review paper they listed as the top of the leaderboard with this 0.88 percent translation error and then after that was published some other works were entered and they beat it on that leaderboard but now there's another one called soft 2 which I think is just soft with different parameters has like 0.6% translation error. Crazy. So it was funny that by just changing the parameters, they got better performance. And the question is, did they actually make their algorithm better or did they just tweak it so it fit that data set better? Right. Do they have any information on other data sets? Like, I guess there's... In their paper, they did kitty and then they did their own data mm. somewhere because unfortunately this kitty set doesn't have IMU data. Right. Oh jeez. Okay. And what's the update rate on the kitty? 23. What what's the frame rate? Good question. I remember it being one hertz, but that must have been for the labeled data. Yeah, this one is faster. Okay. You must, yeah, it, it must be something like 25. It's interesting. Look it up. That's good. Anyway, this is what I talked about last week. So, um, have you heard about this, by the way, Dr. Waslander? Uh, no, no, no. Did I see, was I at your talk last week? No, no, you weren't, so that's why I'm asking. That's what's going on. Yeah, no, sorry. And I missed it, uh, uh, watching it. So I'll have to go back and do that. Apologies. It looks like kitties at 10 hertz. They're raw. It, this page contains our raw data recording sorted of by category. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The data set comprises the following information at 10 hertz, raw and processed grayscale stereo sequences, raw and processed color stereo sequences, 3D Veldine point clouds, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe 10 seems yeah. to be the... Okay. Yeah, so anyway, that's why I recap that part. Um, yeah, thanks. So, and actually, since then, I looked up some other papers that comment on this topic. So there is one new paper about negative results in computer vision. What did hmm. And he basically comments on many topics that have come up in other fields as well, like uh, the fact that negative results often go unpublished. Um, there was a famous paper that said that the majority of scientific discoveries are wrong. Right. Yeah, and the argument was that everyone has to publish 
some improvement to get published, right? Has to present some improvement to get published. And then most of those improvements don't stand up in rigorous testing. wanted to share my screen. Whereas if you were allowed to, or if it was more common to publish negative results, don't bother trying this, it isn't any better. You might get more honest responses or more honest record of the quality of contributions. But that's true of almost all fields, is it not? Yes. I wanted to share. Um, oh, I'm typing into the shared screen instead of the actual window. It's a little hard. That was a fitting comment, though. Just a second. Sorry. What are you trying to do? Just trying to type into the share screen. Well, I thought you wanted to sh show us the XKZ. Value. I do. I do want to do that. Oh, you do? That was a good one, yeah. The p value thing? Why yeah, this is the one I want to look at values. Not significant. So scientists want to investigate if jelly beans cause acne. Um, you have to make this bigger. Yeah. So yeah, they found no link between purple jelly beans and acne. No link between brown jelly beans and so on. Uh, we found a link between green jelly beans and acne. What? what? No. So the headline is green jelly beans are linked to acne with 95% confidence. Because they had a P.05. Mm -hmm. Even though they did 20 experiments with different colors. There we go. This is the summary of why most experiments are wrong we didn't consider the other failed ones. Our most discoveries. <laughs> change the field to accept negative results. Yeah. So yeah, so this is one of the things that this author talks about is how you know you it's hard to get into a conference with the wrong result. Or people will say that you just didn't use the algorithm properly or something if you're trying to reproduce someone else's uh, result. Yeah, we had that actually with Arun, which was fun. Um, we were working on NDT and um, we had trouble getting their stuff to converge uh, from any, any but a really good initialization. So we wrote a whole paper mm. where we said, you know, former NDT doesn't really work on initialization uh, unless, you're, unless you have really accurate initialization, only works a very small domain of attraction. And we printed all these results about how poorly it worked. And then of course ours worked better, right? Um, and that held for our data set. And then they published a paper where they did showed the exact opposite on their data sets, right? Like, and so it sort of just staled there and they happened to continue publishing more and more in NDT. So I think people just totally forgot about what we did. Uh, were you using yeah. your own implementation or their? Yeah, yeah, we were using our own implementations, right? So, or PCL I think came out later. Um, so I think at first we were doing it on our own, uh, but like it's very simple stuff, right? So you just implement it. There's not a lot of parameters there other than like cell size. Um, and then later on, uh, there was PCL reference uh, implementations that you could use as well. Uh, so anyways, one of those sort of discussions, but it, it's the, sort of the opposite, right? We were still trying to prove that our stuff was better and just putting holes in the existing work. Um, but they came along and then just showed the opposite, that theirs was really good compared to the other methods. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it was kind of frustrating. Let's see, yeah. So what's the point of this paper? Are they saying something interesting about it? It's kind of, it makes uh, lots of good points, um, mostly bringing up things that have been brought up in other fields. It is kind mm -hmm. of an obscure paper and I don't think it's particularly well written. Like here he says, uh, computer vision unique in that it's an extremely hard problem which has baffled many smart people. <laughs> <laughs> <Honestly>. oh. <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> it's the oh, problem yeah. with sole author papers. Hey, I hope it Nobody else read it yeah. before it's published. That's um, pretty funny. Yeah, oh, and then there's a big section on hypothesis driven analysis instead of just trying things. Hypothesis driven what? Yeah, so there's a famous saying, if you torch the, the data long enough, it will confess. Um, so one major flaw is analyzing data without first devising a specific hypothesis. Hmm. I don't know. It's relatively subjective. Yeah, this sounds. This sounds. This is a discussion piece, right? This is an opinion. Yeah, yeah, this is the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just fun. Food for thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Analyze stuff here. Yeah. Oh, and I mean, there's. Yeah, it's it's interesting working, you know, towards these CVPR papers on the perception side. Like, everything is so regimented um, relative to what we're doing in robotics, right? Like, the data sets have to be the same data sets for everybody. The tests and the evaluation metrics are the same. You know, you write these giant tables of numbers, but then you know, you change every hyperparameter and you have 400 instances of your network and some work better on some parts of the data than others. Like, it's like the, the results are basically amb ambiguous every time. So even though they try to have this sort of rigorous comparison, that's pretty flawed and right. you're just tweaking and tuning on a unsolvable problem, right? Like there's, there's not a lot of rigor. There's just a bunch of needles and haystacks that are being hunted. Yeah. And so I assume if people implement it again, right, if they don't know the exact hyperparameters and every detail of the implementation, they'd get completely different answers. And just retraining from scratch, they would get completely different answers in terms of the quality. So it's unclear to me how repeatable these results are, right? Like, you know, here, use my weights for my network and you'll get the same answer on the exact same data. But how does that generalize? You know, do I retrain on with the same structure? Do I get the same results? It's pretty vague. Um, and I guess for us, the problem is feature detection, right? Like the variability with which, or the, yeah. the image quality, you know, the, the impact of the individual camera on, on the results is pretty big, I think. And then all of the, you know, details, so that's the whole cascade, like how well you calibrate determines how well you can do localization, et cetera, et cetera. Kind yeah, of so me, kind of reminds me of how, like, when I read genetic algorithm papers or the whole meta heuristic field, like on ant colonies or particle swarms, where it's very heuristic based, and they always come up with these papers coming up and saying like they solve these problems better than than the other algorithms, but the the uh, yeah it's all about hyperparameter tuning because you can't say one heuristic is definitely better than the other heuristic because mm. it's very hard to mathematically prove that right right and this exhaustive demonstration doesn't really make sense you know it doesn't really hold up yeah it takes too much time mm -hmm. and it's not accurate because you just change the data literally start over is about this like performance characterization and computer vision. I found a lot more about computer vision things like object detection than I did about uh, things that are more related to SLAM or even yeah. feature, feature detection. But this paper actually had a section on feature detection. So they suggest some questions you should ask uh, if you're want to evaluate your algorithm, which is like how, or you want to get a good idea of the algorithms in the field. So how is it currently done? There are data sets for which you have the truth. And uh, they have some sections like this and they have one for feature detection. So that might be worth looking at where they answer these questions. 
Yeah, the feature detection ones in computer vision are kind of funny. They'll take 16 images of one scene from different viewpoints or, you know, blurred versus not blurred and then see how stable the feature is, right? Over, you know, some, some particular variable like lighting or uh, viewpoint or whatever it is. And so it's very specific to the particular camera and scene that you're looking at. You know, often they'll have pictures of like graffiti on a flat wall and then look at, you know, 90 degree variations in viewpoint. Or th this is at least a set. I, so I remember going through this with Sid um, a while back. So they have very, very sort of, I guess, non robotic -y interests in these features, right? For universal matching. So it, it might not actually be that relevant, but it's, it's trying to get there. So they have these, you know, different invariances, rotation and uh, depth or transformation, translation, and then viewpoint, and then affine, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of toy, right? It's kind of overly controlled. So, I don't know. Yeah. It's a tough one, for sure. Cool. I have to go look at your presentation now. i got to go figure that one out. Okay, and then next slide about Kitty benchmarks. Uh, we tried to look up papers about data set bias, benchmark bias. And again, I found a lot more about computer vision things. So this is a famous paper that I think Ali even referenced in his presentations, hmm. um, where he talked about the same things in CVPR about object recognition data sets. So data sets have been blamed for narrowing the focus of object recognition research, reducing it to a single benchmark number. Yep. And so that's why the benchmarks have become closed worlds where people only work with like one thing. I think the only way to know which method is the best is just have a robotics competition. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the, this is an interesting paper because I look at some things like how well does a uh, detector trained on one data set generalized to something else. And they even tried to see if a classifier could determine which data set some images came from. And then they mm -hmm. could, which kind of reveals that the data sets were really biased or easily distinguishable. And um, so yeah, it doesn't apply completely to us because like a visual odometry algorithm won't yeah. really per train. But we, as the authors of the algorithm, could overtrain for it or like choose parameters specific to some data set. Just realized you guys haven't seen me this whole time. Yes. Um, so uh, my thought here is e exactly right. Like we build our, I mean, and this is this is standard, right? You build our VIO for indoor environments, like lab with lots of features, all at two meters. Um, or hallways or, you know, and then we tried to take it outside and suddenly everything failed, even though the images were beautifully clear with lots of great features. They were just too far away, right? MCP TAM suffered from this for sure. Uh, the difference between uh, centimeter level accuracy and maybe meter level accuracy when we went outside, um, it was pretty dramatic. And it was clear that, you know, we picked all the parameters in such a way that it worked best in the lab. Um, and you know that's pretty standard. And I think the the to get back to Chris's point, the um, the thing to do here not so much a competition but continued repeated world use, right? Like outdoor or application very variable application use, or very you know a varied set of applications. So I'm really excited that we're trying to do this simultaneously for Gimbaled Slam, as well as for the car, right? because the car is going to be driving around in different environments and we're going to find out every time it fails because we're going to hit somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe not exactly, but you get the idea. And for the drones, right, it takes us a while to actually fly. So we've never had that much data, but we tend to fly, um, you know, first indoors in the flight arena and then outside. So we have that sort of variation there, right? But the flights tend to be in open spaces and so suffer from those kind of uh, features, right? Far away, uh, mostly at the horizon, right? Um, and the ground is pretty boring uh, and so hard to use. Um, so I think, yeah, we've got, we've got the opportunity to have a reasonably varied set of conditions. You, you know there's tons of other ones we can 
bank on like uh, Clearpath keeps asking us to do warehouses, right? Um, and things like that. So we could have we could have millions of meters of data in warehouses if we wanted to. All we have to do is ask Clearpath for it. So in terms of collecting the data and evaluating, we could definitely expand what we're trying to do. Um, but there's a you know a cost to, to handling all these data sets, and, and that is that your results don't look as good because they're different on every set, or you have to tune for every set so far, right? Um, but it'd be interesting going forward for sure. So yeah, this was their picture of how in the different data sets the images of cars were really distinctive, hmm. or each one had something different. ImageNet yeah, only knows racing. It's great. Is it really? Yeah, like Ooh. this one is all race cars. <laughs> this one is all cars that are occluded by things. The 15 million f image image net only knows race cars? Probably not only, but um, I don't know. I think a... this, this image might show like the most distinctive ones that they were able to classify. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah, the most, the most discriminative. Yeah. All the Caltech pictures are the side of a car. Probably the other ones didn't have race cars is the thing. Um, Interesting. And label me as occluded cars. That's funny. Okay. So that's the thing. And then uh, benchmarks. Yeah. So how are benchmarks currently not rigorously analyzed? So for example, in the cityscapes, they try to say their benchmark or their, their data set is better because of these three things, the volume of annotations, the distribution of classes and the complexity of scenes. And scene complexity for them means like the number of pedestrians in every image. Mm -hmm. So they say like, look, we're better because we have more pedestrians in the image and a wider range of distances of the objects. Um, so probably their data set is better for that, but it's not really a rigorous analysis. Right. Why it's better. So um, one interesting paper I found, although it's not highly cited or anything, so I don't know. Um, well, these are all brand new papers you're looking at, right? It's hard to get a lot of citations. Actually, yeah, except actually this one, they had a similar one from two years ago. That wasn't cited. It had okay. eight citations um, on the same topic. Yep. So yeah, this is safety analysis for computer vision. So their premise is, yeah, the algorithms that do well on benchmarks can do poorly in real life because benchmarks limited samples, there's a little evaluation of the benchmarks themselves. And they want to have a good data set for the benchmark, which has all the difficult cases, which they call hazards. And it's organized so you can find the only the images with certain difficult cases. And it's also not redundant to avoid wasting time or overtraining on stuff. Um, so they propose applying something called hazard and operability analysis, which is like an old system that was originally used to design chemical plants and stuff. Um, to identify any hazards and how that works is they would look at every aspect of the system and this approach has lots of kind of buzzwords or jargon by the way so they would call things locations and then they would look at all the parameters at that location so for example if a worker would be adding a reagent chemical to something and they would look at parameters like the flow rate of the chemical then they would have what are called what are they, guide words or something, some kind of adjectives. And they would try to apply all the possible adjectives to the parameter, like what happens if the flow rate is too fast, too slow? Or what happens if the worker adds the reagent too early or too late? And that's how they would identify hazards. So this paper, uh, they say, why don't we apply that to computer vision? <laughs> so it's a little, it's a little funny seeming. But I think their general idea, which is like test driven development for computer vision systems is okay. 
Um, so this is an example of some things they describe as hazards. So like part of an image with no texture, the glare reflections, uh, lens reflections, underexposure. And they gave an example of evaluating Kitty with it. So their plan is to annotate all of the images uh, with what hazards they contain. Then they evaluate some algorithms to see how poorly they perform on those parts of the image. They just use stereo vision algorithms where the point is to extract 3D data from the 2D images. This is pretty funny. So I, this is pretty much what every researcher is doing to try to beat everyone else in Kitty, right? It's sort of going through the failure cases in the test set, okay. figuring out if they can, you know, add variations and then have extra data there, right? That Ali mm -hmm. talked about this in his course. Like this is literally just retraining on your hard problems. Um, uh, okay. So, but but I guess they're trying to trying to do a, you know, I guess it's a human aided learning approach, right? Yeah, I should talk um, to Ali about this because I didn't see that. Um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, but but the the idea is literally that, right? You want to improve your performance, so you find all your failures, and then um, uh, you take that set, and then you do small perturbations on that those images, and you add in more samples in your yeah. test data, basically. Yeah, let's say yeah. So they want to systematically do that, and then yep, yep. Maybe add more yep. more of these hazards that made it work the worst into the test. Yep. Data. Yep. So they call it data augmentation. Oh, okay. um, that's that's also just in general. You can just amplify the size of your data set by doing small perturbations or small noises or disturbances to the images, and you know shifts and things like this and rotations and um, uh, adding adding a bit of blur or stuff like that. Um, and so that just makes your data set bigger and hopefully helps to keep your um, learning generalized. Mm -hmm but you can also focus in on specifically the failures and then amplify that data. Yeah, uh, yeah this so. seems like a good idea to yep. Yep. find where it fails and then only. Yep. Uh, and so from our perspective, this would be, you know, like sequences of images where the VO loses feature tracks or where the, right? Like we would have very similar things. Now we're not learning um, features yet, right? We're, we're not doing deep features in any way, although we probably have to at some point. Yeah, um, these same things like no texture or something that would hamper us. Exactly. Yep. Um, and so what we would do, right, is we would look at every failure on a data set or we would look at where, the, and what's funny about it is the metrics that we're using for VO are sort of over the sequence, right, as opposed to individual point to point. Um, and what matters to us is like, those few steps where things really go badly after which all of our errors grow dramatically against ground truth. Right? Um, so we have to find the point of failure almost, right? Or the, the place where the localization uh, degrades. Uh, so it's a little bit different in our context. Um, but I guess that's just a matter of getting the... Um, uh, maybe, possible. I mean, it seems similar. Like you want to find not only the image at which it got worse, but the part of the image that uh, messed up your algorithm. Yeah, but but got worse. Like every error after that, relative to ground truth, is huge. Whereas you're probably not actually having trouble with anything except for oh, okay. your first yeah. mistake, right? So we just right. need to be sure that we're doing the errors in a way that's incremental, or that you know somehow right. takes into account previous failures, like frame to frame for VO, for example. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Right. And like errors over the map are expected to grow with distance traveled. Um, Right, um, and so when you do loop closures and things like this, there's right all kinds of compounding effects. So it's not necessarily true that the image is farther away from the the origin of the map or harder. Right, it's just that they're always going to have higher error. So, anyways, you have to separate those effects for us. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah, and they actually have this big catalog of hazards. Oh, specifically for vision to, testing. And to just look at, yeah. Um, so they have this whole list of like, are there many objects, no objects, or objects are all including each other? 
Yeah, Christoph would love this stuff, right? This is great. Yeah, they even have ones related to your algorithms when you try to run code in parallel and stuff, which yep. I have a feeling will will affect us. Could you do me a favor and just send that uh, paper and this link to Christoph? And just say I suggested it, that it was an interesting catalog of failure modes for, for vision. Yes, John. Cool, that's neat. We can show you the list of error codes. But exactly right, yeah, yeah. Things might affect us. Hard cases, easy, mediums, and hards. That's what they're working on over yeah, there. Yeah, like your real-time performance of your processing takes longer than expected, might cause your program to crash. If you like limit the number of features you use in every frame, you also make your algorithm work worse. Yep. So it's neat. Okay. More questions? Yeah, that's all for this part. The next one was somebody else's um, calibration questions. It's uh, the calibration questions from Jason, right? Yeah, Jason. Do we have answers? So we can discuss these things, although Jason is not here. Right, right. I want to pause on Jason and Ben we have, right, that are missing? Right. Yeah. Why is calibration so challenging? It's impossible to find the right answer because we don't, we don't know what the right answer is. We have no ability to ground truth calibration. Um, other than that, it's not any more challenging than any other optimization, I would say. Do we have no ability to ground truth it? Like, isn't the, what's the fiducial target? Like a ground truth type well, thing? Even fiducial targets, you also have ground truth problems. Unless we, unless we put, no, 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 like it's not augmented. Like, even if we put like mocap reflectors, you now have a mocap uh, intrinsics uh, with the cameras as well. Calibration. Like, like what is the true focal length of a camera? Let's, let's try that, right? How, how, there's no way to directly measure it. You have to infer it from data you've collected, right? Sure. You, can't, you can't use like a micrometer or anything, right? Well, you could, I don't know, you can measure the size of your sensor and then... But to get to the optical center that is somewhere in the middle of the lens, right? Like it's, no, it's not... Have, physical, it's, oh, okay. If you have a target of known size, can't you? And then like it's a known distance away. Yeah, you're doing an optimization, right? Because you're taking a set of measurements that give you uh, uh, indirect measurement of that parameter. Yeah. And then you can optimize over it and you get an answer, right? Okay. And then you can look at residuals and see how much they agree. But, but like you don't know for a fact that you've got it right or that there isn't some bias in all of the measurements or uh, anything like that, right? Yeah. Um, and I'd say the same thing for the extrinsics. That these are sort of non-physical points that you have to somehow measure, right? Their location. So anyways. Yeah. How accurate are lens focal length values typically to the true because the data sheets all have a focal length, right? And they have some information, but that's like, it's not precise enough or how good is that as a starting point usually? I don't know. And yeah, what's good enough? Like what's precise enough? Yeah. Or I don't know. we haven't done that. So, th so this is sort of on our list, right? This sensitivity analysis to the parameters in our calibration process. Um, so Jason and Arun and I are hoping to get to this at some point. Um, we're basically beyond this idea of degeneracy or uh, non-observability, right? Where you just can't figure out the parameter because you haven't measured enough, uh, or you don't have measurements um, that, that uh, constrain it. Um, the sensitivity would be the, uh, an assessment of how, you know, uh, small variations in the measurement value affect your parameter estimate. Um, and that's literally just a gradient at the optimal point um, or at, at the end of your optimization. And then um, you can sort of assess based on the set of measurements you have, how uh, easy it is, or like, you know, yeah, how, how small perturbations in those measurements would affect your parameter estimate. Um, so I think that sort of helps a bit because then you know if, you know, you like to what precision uh, a 1% change in your, your measurement value would 
would affect your uh, parameter value. So I think that's probably where we're headed to try to say something about it. But it's kind of vague, right? Um, and then everything else is empirical. You get people reporting things like my, you know, visual odometry or my slam map accuracy over the entire map was, was far better when I had a calibration accuracy of 0.1 pixels versus 0.2 pixels, right? Um, so, so there's sort of, there's ballparks, um, but can, you know, can you get to 0.05? I, I don't know. This is just like the qualms of having a real world that we live in, right? And yeah. Yeah. Ever, like, yeah. Yeah. And so, so I think those were the questions that Jason was struggling with too, right? Like, I'm like, you got to get calibration done. He's like, define done. Right. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and, and I think there's a dearth of this. Like when we look at the calibration literature, we see people claiming things about how good their calibration is. Uh, but they are only ever doing subsets of the sensors and uh, they're not really evaluating the impact of the calibration, right? Uh, they're just sort of proving that it works when they're done. Um, so yeah, I think there's, I think like I've, I've said this for a while, I think we could really do something cool in a unified calibration for vehicles, you know, and drones. Um, if we really spent a lot of time on it, I think the problem is, is that it's, marginally less sexy than working on the actual slam problem, right? That lets the robots roam around and build maps as opposed to, you know, just being marginally more accurate on the maps that are already being built. So I don't know. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts? I, I remember Jason mentioning with the LiDAR to camera, like there wasn't any metrics out there for that that he could even compare to or something. Like he was yep. just like, I got this number. What do I, like, what do I do yeah. now? Like, is yeah. this, um, and how, like, I guess you mentioned that it seemed like the, the results from, hey, I had a better total slam solution, like over the course of the trajectory is tied into my calibration, but it's, there's no real way to, like how, there's so many other effects that could be in place other than just your calibration there, right? So okay. how does there, like, I guess, how do you one to one know that your calibration is directly the result of this or directly leading to this good result, right? Like that's yep. yep, exactly. Yeah, and there's always this sort of, um, I've, I've talked about this one before, but this is the, uh, are you working on a problem that's actually a problem, right? So let's say we take, I don't know, uh, LSD SLAM as our baseline solution and we run 17 different calibrations on our car and then we drive around with LSD SLAM and we show how uh, our map accuracies change with respect to our GPS ground truth for each of the 17 calibrations, right? Um, and uh, like, what have we done at the end, right? We've relied on this hokey system. We've relied on this ground truth from a sensor that also has error in it. And we've modified parameters um, in a calibration that's a model of the overall actual system anyways, right? And so, you know, the best calibration from that set of 17, how transferable is that to uh, DSO or MCP TAM, right? Or to the next car at a slightly different height or to a totally different environment or to a different set of features being tracked or whatever it is, right? There's just so much complexity that um, these evaluations uh, start to uh, falter a bit, right? And, and you're not sure that had you just picked something better in the pipeline, the if the choice of calibrations that you came up with might work differently, right? Or might might lead to a different winner. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a hard one. This actually kind of brings up the question: Would say, for example, if we did. Uh, like gazebo suddenly had photorealistic simulations. Right. That would be able to give us a lot of ground truths and be able to let us evaluate slam solutions in a fair manner. Uh, instead of saying like, oh, we didn't calibrate well enough. Or, yep. <laughs> or like uh, Unreal, right? Which is what they're trying to do on uh, uh, the perception team. Yeah. Even Actually, even... Um, MIT has caught up to, to having a dedicated team to do that as well. They have a dedicated team to do what? To do that Unreal uh, 
So like a couple of weeks ago, I found a MIT video of how they built their own drone and they simulated a living room. Oh, okay. So they, okay, they had a quadrotor flying around in the flight arena in circles, but what it was actually seeing was uh, a simulated environment in the living room. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you sent that out, yep. And then they basically ran VO on the simulated environment. Mm-hmm. Things like that. Yep, yep. So in, so the the vehicle was tracked with a Vicon system, right? Tracked with a Vicon system, yeah. And the Vicon report was being sent into the game engine, right? Yes. And then, so so it was getting the viewpoint from where it was the, where it was actually in the real world, yeah. in the simulated world, yeah. and then it was doing VO on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty weird. Yeah. It's cool though. It is. Um, I mean, in terms of contribution, I think they were just showing off uh, their drone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the fact that they were trying to do something like a simulated, well, augmented simulated environment to evaluation. But it's a relative, I think it's the, I don't think I've any, seen any other slam or VO paper that tried to do something like that. I'm not sure. No, no, I agree. Yeah. Um, completely simulated slam. Yeah. But then it's actually controlling a vehicle. Yes. Yep. Because that would eliminate the need to actually calibrate the camera. Right. Right. Um, and so, okay, so let me, let me play devil's advocate then. What's the value of a slam system? that works the best only for perfectly calibrated cameras in simulated environments, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, unless that's surprisingly realistic or achievable, right? You somehow have to understand the sensitivities to your calibration parameters of your SLAM systems as well, right? So, yeah. Anyways, this is, I think this is, we know this is hard, right? This is always gonna be the issue. And so when we pick an evaluation metric for either calibration or for our VO, um, we want to not just do a single environment and a single, um, you know, type of image, right? Like, I think, uh, you know, it's too easy at this point. And so I, I think we'll see more and more of that, of people evaluating their stuff on different environments. And, you know, what we should probably push would be something where you didn't have to change parameters for every environment you flew in, right? Um, so that would be really interesting to see if people are getting to that point yet. Yeah, the simulated stuff, there's always going to be this question about how realistic is it, right? Like perfect lighting, you know, zero camera effects or whatever it is, right? And I mean, they're even putting those in, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yep. More thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I saw a paper earlier today about synthetic data sets, but I can't find it again. Mm. <laughs> so otherwise, I would. Yeah. It's, it's useful for when we don't want to go outside. <laughs> totally. In, in the winter. Yeah. Well, and it's useful for not having to spend as much time outside if you can do it on synthetic first, right? And then everything outside should go a lot faster. I mean, that was the whole idea behind the gazebo simulator, right? And I think that saved you guys a fair bit of time. I'm sorry, say again, uh, what about gazebo? So your gazebo simulator, evaluating all of your code in gazebo before you tried to fly it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's helped immensely, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Because or else we have to spend forever going outside and setting it up and flying it once. Yep, <laughs> and then realizing there's a bug, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they're, they're different. I think that's called like verification versus validation. So oh, I see. Yeah. Just find your bug is one thing, and then the other part is mm. whether it's good enough to validate that it works in all conditions. Mm. Right, right, right. Yeah, I guess that's true. In theory and simulation, you could run it through a much larger range of conditions quickly, right? Yeah. That would be kind of neat. Which kind of reminds me, that landing paper, the mm -hmm. Montreal 
high speed landing paper. It's like they've, if someone did that same experiment, but flew it 10 times, and they claimed that it landed 10 times, would that not be a, a good enough result to be worthy of publication? I mean, only if it, so here's the funny thing, right? Repeating somebody else's work and showing that it worked 10 times in a row, that doesn't really count as a contribution because that other work already did it, right? The other work, what the Montreal guys did was they kind of had a GPS relaying back to the drone um, at one hertz. Mm -hmm. So just removing that GPS on the car, I don't know. Because they, they weren't just using vision only. They were also using GPS. Gotcha. Yep. So if there has never been a vision only landing, right? and you can demonstrate it, right? Uh, regardless of the reliability, then yeah, that's a contribution, right? That would be removing the GPS and presenting a method that works even though you don't have any kind of offboard scale or inertial measurement, right, of your position. Um, doing 10 landings at speed and all of them working perfectly is a reinforcement of whatever the new idea is you had that enabled that, right? but in and of itself is not a paper if you're just repeating somebody's method that already exists, right? Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, it's sort of frustrating. Like this back to the like, right, we're not just implementers, we have to actually uh, provide some positive new result, right, to get published. And so I think, you know, what we've come up with, I think is pretty rock solid in terms of new. I've certainly never seen anyone incorporate two cameras one of which is gimbaled into the landing process, right? Mm. And so the work we do or we did in other papers to enable that, we can use, uh, right? And we can um, incorporate into our overall landing approach. And that's a contribution, right? That's for sure. And then I'd like to see it land 10 times in a row, right? And outdo them in terms of overall ability. when we can claim that that was much easier because we had the gimbaled cameras, right? but that would be something we'd probably also need to demonstrate if we claimed it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. The yeah. Montreal guys actually had two cameras as well. Oh, did they? Two static? Were they doing stereo or? They were doing one static and one gimbal. Oh, really? But they switched between them or something, right? I think they were saying that one was used by the DJI flight stack to do VO. Yep. And then the gimbal one was just to do gimbal tag tracking. Exactly. Yeah. So they're not using the gimbal at all in their localization, right? Or are they? Like they did what we did essentially, right? Where you land purely on the gimbal and you forego your VO. You don't even use your VO as you're doing the actual landing, right? Or no? After we read the paper. I'm pretty sure they were doing some kind of VO, but they said that they switched it off uh, on approach. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Because they can't, because it was looking at the target, right? Yes. So the VO was wrong. Yes. Yep. Fun. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. Let's call it. Um, I just have one more thing I wanted to mention. It has to do with SVO. Um, I took a look through the paper. So, oh, yeah. um, so it, I was right. It was, it's 16, sorry, not 16. It's four by four patches throughout the image that they do an initial photometric error minimization on from the previous time step to the current time step. So that's the first thing. And that's kind of their initial guess as to how their feature, uh, their pose of their camera, their new pose. Then what they do is they have a separate thread for mapping. And that was something I'm still not entirely familiar with, how they're doing their actual, like the, the actual um, methods behind their map creation and stuff like that, something I'm not fully versed in yet. Um, but their map that they create from keyframes, they then do, it's called feature alignment on relaxation, image relaxation or something. And so they're able to actually then do um, another photometric error minimization for each patch to the map 
and then they do a reprojection error minimization for the map as well on your regular bundle, just typical bundle adjustment. So that's the three steps that they do to further refine their camera pose. But their starting initial guess is on four by four pixel patches throughout the entire image. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the second step was really strange to me. I, I mean, strangers and I had to read it over like multiple times and I still don't know if I really fully get it. Mm -hmm. um, it's called, what is it here? Relaxation through feature alignment. Um, and they were talking about how it actually violates the epipolar constraints, but they do that to achieve a higher correlation between feature patches. So, yeah. Because what they're doing now, I think, is instead of minimizing all the feature patches within the image, they're minimizing the reprojection error for each feature patch um, to, to their map. But when you're doing each feature patch, you're no longer keeping the epipolar constraints is how I understand it. Cause you're looking at each one individually per se. Hmm. Um, and so, but it apparently works. So maybe I need to give it another read, but that's, yeah. 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 But they, I specifically highlighted this step can be understood as a relaxation step that violates the epipolar constraints. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> cool. I guess that's no longer. <laughs> so, Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look at it again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'll pick your brain more at some point now. Sounds good. Sounds well, good. It'll be a good discussion because I need to, yeah, it'll be good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, All right. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Yeah. We'll talk again soon. Again soon. See you later. Yep.